Well, I'm here tonight to talk to you about Woody Guthrie, who in a short period of maybe a dozen years of his life wrote over a thousand American songs, and he didn't use an original melody for any one of them. Every one of those songs, he took an old song that he knew when he was younger and recycled the melody, and most of those tunes came off of the old 78 RPM recordings of the original Carter family, which you can probably find in the library's collection today. I'll start off with one of his songs. This is a song that was recycling a melody for an old Christian hymn called The World Is Not My Home, and Woody decided it was gonna be a song about farm workers called I Ain't Got No Home. I ain't got no home, I'm just a rambling round. I'm just a wandering worker and I go from town to town. The police make it hard, boys, wherever I may roam. And I ain't got no home in this world anymore. I was farming on the shares and always I was poor. My crops I laid unto the banker's store. My wife took down and died upon the cabin floor. And I ain't got no home in this world anymore. Now my brothers and my sisters, they are stranded on this road. A hot and dusty road that a million feet have trod. The landlord took my home and drove me from my door. And I ain't got no home in this world anymore. Now as I wander around, it's mighty plain to see. This old world is a great and a funny place to be. The gambling man is rich. The working man is poor, and I ain't got no home in this world anymore. So today Woody Guthrie has become kind of a folk hero, and there's certain rules about being a folk hero whether you're Jesus Christ or Robin Hood or the President of the United States, you don't get to be a folk hero unless about half the people are for you and the other half of the people are against you. That is the nature of being a folk hero. So you have to appreciate that when Woody was growing up in Oklahoma in the days during the Depression, times were very hard and there were a lot of outlaws and some of them were considered local heroes because like Robin Hood, they were perceived as being stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. And one of those was a fellow by the name of Pretty Boy Floyd. So to make this song, Woody Guthrie re recycled an even older tune about an older bandit, an old ballad called The Ballad of Floyd Collins, and he made a song about Pretty Boy Floyd. Won't you gather round me, children? A story I will tell about pretty boy Floyd the outlaw. Oklahoma knew him well. It was in the town of Shawnee on a Saturday afternoon. His wife beside him in the wagon as into town they rode. Well, a deputy sheriff approached them in a manner rather rude, using vulgar words of language that Mrs. Floyd overheard. Well, pretty boy grabbed a long chain, and the deputy grabbed his gun, and in the fight that followed, he laid that deputy down. He took to the trees and timbers to live a life of shame. Every crime in Oklahoma was added to his name. He took to the trees and timbers of the Canadian River shore, and pretty boy found a welcome at every farmer's door.
song will tell you of a farmer who came to beg a meal and underneath his napkin left a thousand dollar bill. It was many a starving farmer, the same old story told, how the outlaw paid the mortgage and saved their little home. It was in Oklahoma City, it was on a Christmas day, there came a whole carload of groceries with a note to say. Well, you say that I'm an outlaw. Well, you say that I'm a thief. Well, here's a Christmas dinner for the families on relief. Well, as through this world you travel, you'll see lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. world you travel and it's through this world you roam you won't ever see an outlaw drive a family from their home Woodrow Wilson Guthrie was born in Okima, Oklahoma on July 14th of 1912, just 12 days after Woodrow Wilson was nominated for the presidency. Everybody called him Woody. And from his father, Charlie, he got a great sense of optimism. From his mother, Nora, he inherited her love of the old songs and fear that he might also someday inherit some of her madness. Charlie Guthrie went down to Oklahoma after they had discovered oil there and kicked all the Indians out of the Indian territory and started uh, having a big oil boom there, Woody explained that his father, Charlie Guthrie, was the, um, was the first county clerk in Okima, Oklahoma, and Woody said that he was the man who used to miscount the votes at election time. <laughs> Charlie Guthrie was one of those two-fisted Democrats in the early days of Oklahoma when it was really the frontier territory and there was still a great deal of fist fighting to settle arguments. Woody describes Okima as a place where a lot of his neighbors were black and a lot of his neighbors spoke Spanish. and. Uh, his father did pretty well in that oil boom. Woody said that in the old days, when he was a little kid, his father was worth thirty-five dollars or $40,000 in pre-depression money. And Charlie Guthrie built a very nice $8,000 house, one of the nicest houses in town where he and the family lived. And Woody's childhood would have been fairly uneventful if not for all of the fires. Um, at one point, there was a fire in the house, and the fire was so bad, his sister Clara who was about 14 before Woody turned, he must have been six or seven years old. She was burned so bad she, she was killed in that fire. And the newspaper reported it as an accident, but the neighbors thought a little bit differently. As she was dying, she told Woody, she called him Woodblock, that was her nickname for him. She told him not to cry, and he did his best to keep those feelings inside. And then a few years later, there was another fire that burned that house to the ground, and the Guthries were in financial trouble had to move to a much less nice house in town. And when Woody was about 15 years old, his mother threw a kerosene lantern at her husband, Charlie, while he was sleeping and set him on fire from his navel to his neck. And he was burned so badly that while he was laying in the hospital, his lodge brothers took his wife, Nora, to the insane asylum in Norman, Oklahoma. And that's where she finished her life. And fire was to plague Woody through his life. Much later in New York City, when he was married to Marjorie Mazia, their first child, Kathy Ann, was killed in a fire when Marjorie went across the street to get some milk and a wire and a repaired radio shorted and set the curtains on fire. And little Kathy Ann, uh, the older sister of Jody and Arlo and Nora, died in that fire. The child who was the inspiration for so many of those terrific children's songs that Woody Guthrie wrote that you could find in the library on Smithsonian Folkway CDs called Nursery Days and Songs to Grow On. And much later, after Woody was very sick in the 1950s, he hitchhiked out to Florida to visit Stetson Kennedy, the man who infiltrated and exposed the Klan. And while he was there, he, he poured some gasoline onto a campfire. And of course, the fire burst up and it 
burned his arm and his face, and he lost the ability to play the guitar and lost the powers of speech. So, as Pete Seeger used to say, the fire gods were after Woody. In that period when he hung out in that apartment building in New York City with his little daughter, Kathy Ann, the little girl that he called Stack of Bones, that was his nickname for her, his wife Marjorie was a dancer in the Martha Graham troupe in New York, so she had a pretty good paying job while Woody stayed home and took care of the kids, as so many folk singers do. So he followed her around and made up songs about just all the interesting things she said when she was three and four years old. And Woody's children's songs are phenomenal. You can find them in the library or on the internet today or even on YouTube. And I'll, uh, I'll sing one of these with you today. First of all, I want to explain where Woody stole his tune. There used to be an old song, um, let's see, it was called The Danville Gal. It was a country song that you may have heard. And Woody took that song and recycled it and made a children's song based upon conversations he had with his four-year-old. Now, if you spend time with a four-year-old, you probably already know they like to ask a lot of questions that begin with the word, why? And this is how they find out about the world. Why this and why that and why the other thing? And if kids remember to ask grown-ups questions when they've had a good night's sleep and a good meal in their tummy and they're in a good mood, they'll find that grown-ups give very intelligent answers. But if you interrogate grown-ups when they are hungry or cranky or sleepy, they are liable to answer your question with the word, because. And Woody thought it was kind of funny how kids would very sincerely say, why? And grown-ups would very insincerely say, because. So he did what he always did with situations of this kind. He recycled an old country tune from his childhood and made a new song about it. And uh, it's a folk song today. And tonight you're the folk, so I'll teach it to you. Maybe we can sing it together. <laughs> Why can't a dish break a hammer? Tell me why, oh why? Well, for one thing, a hammer has a mighty hard head. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. And he made a chorus that went like this. It went, why, oh why, oh why, oh why? Tell me why, oh why? Just because, 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 because. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Can we all sing that together? Oh, why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why? Tell me why, oh, why? Just because, 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 because. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Why can't a bird eat an elephant? Tell me why, oh, why? Well, for one thing, an elephant has a mighty tough skin. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Let's sing it together, you ready? Oh, why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why? Tell me why, oh, why? Just because, 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 because. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Why won't you answer my questions? Tell me why, oh, why? Well, the truth is, I don't know the answers. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Oh, why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why? Tell me why, oh, why? Just because, 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 because. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. What do you got, three? Woody Guthrie's brain was a great psychic landfill of all the music he had been exposed to in his life. Some of the songs that he recycled were new songs recorded by the Carter family. Some of them were old English language ballads that he'd learned when he was a kid in Okima. And one of those songs tells a story that you probably know in a bunch of different versions. Um, if you know the one called The Water is Wide, or um, Grieve, Oh Grieve, or Careless Love, um, they all tell the same story. There is a tavern in the town. Here's the one that Woody recycled the melody of so many times, an old song from England uh, about a girl who's upset that her lovers found some new girl down at the tavern to sit on his knee. It was called The Butcher's Boy. And just to show you where the melody came from, I'll sing you the first verse. <laughs> Butcher's boy, I love so well. He courted me both night and day, but now with me he will not stay. So Woody took that song and 
hanging out with his four-year-old daughter, Kathy Ann, he made a children's song, and this is what he did with it. Mama, oh mama, come wash my face. Come wash my face, come wash my face. Mama, oh mama, come wash my face and make it nice and clean o. Woody was the kind of guy who could make up a song in a moment's notice for any occasion in any situation. And I'll tell you a true story that I learned from my friend Frank Hamilton, who I visited a couple weeks ago down in Decatur, Georgia. Um, Frank was born in 1934. He grew up in Los Angeles over in the Fairfax district. And uh, he's the man who replaced Eric Darling in the group The Weavers after Eric replaced Pete Seeger, the banjo player in that group. So Frank told me this story. Frank went to Fairfax High School back in the days when a very popular play in the United States was the Yip Harburg Burton Lane musical called Finian's Rainbow. Those of you who are familiar with this play will know that the main character's name is Woody, based on Woody Guthrie, whom Yip Harburg was a great fan of, the man who wrote all those words. So um, the high school in uh, Los Angeles was going to do a production of Finian's Rainbow, and in it there is a harmonica player, and Frank thought he would get a harmonica lesson from one of the best harmonica players that he had heard on recordings, and that was Woody Guthrie. So he looked in the directory and called a friend who had Woody's number in New York City, and from Los Angeles to New York City, he made a long-distance call to Woody's apartment, and Woody wasn't there. Woody's wife, Marjorie, answered the phone. And Frank said, I was hoping I could get, you know, on the phone a, a, a harmonica lesson from your husband, Woody. And Marjorie said, well, Frank, Woody went out for a quart of milk about seven days ago, and he hasn't been back since. I'll bet you a nickel he has hitchhiked all the way across the United States and is over at Will Gear's house up in Topanga Canyon. Well, incredulous, Frank hung up the phone, looked up Will Gear's number, called to Panga Canyon, and sure enough, Will said, yeah, Woody's out in the seed shack. He arrived there this morning. If you can hitchhike up the mountain to Topanga Canyon, you can get a harmonica lesson from Woody. So sure enough, that's what the teenage Frank Hamilton did, Woody being one of his heroes. He's brought his banjo, and the two of them jammed together. And apparently, Woody Guthrie had somehow gotten a gig for the ladies' auxiliary of the VFW in Los Angeles, California, a full hour's distance from up on the mountain where Will lived in Topanga Canyon on the Pacific Coast. So Will got the pickup truck all warmed up and brought it around, and Woody took the guitar, lay down in the back of the pickup truck, and promptly went to sleep. Frank and Will jumped in the pickup truck and all the way down the mountain across the Pacific Coast Highway, up Venice Boulevard, all the way into Los Angeles to the ladies' auxiliary at the VFW they drove. Woody getting kind of dusty in the back of the car there. Woody didn't care much about that stuff. He had his work boots on and his Levi's. And so they pulled up at the VFW and they went and there was a great big banquet. All these ladies in white gloves with their hair done and their makeup and their earrings and their best clothing. And Woody was shoveling the food into his face and not even chewing it. And a beautiful older lady with blue hair and white gloves came up and said, Mr. Guthrie, how come you never sing any songs about the ladies' auxiliary? <laughs> well, Woody, with a mouth full of food, picked up his guitar, and while still chewing his food, he proceeded to sing, without a moment's notice, this song. Oh, the ladies' auxiliary, it's a good auxiliary, about the best auxiliary that you ever did see. If you need an auxiliary, See the ladies' auxiliary, it's that lady's auxiliary. And he picked up his plate of food and began to finish eating. So Woody was the kind of guy who could make up a song any place, anywhere, for anything. I'll give you a few more examples of his songwriting. If you have a young musician in your house, it doesn't really matter what instrument they're playing, one of the first tunes that they will get to work on is a tune that was written by Mr. Schumann way back in 1844, the one called The Happy Farmer. And if you're not familiar with that melody, I'll give you a little taste of that. It's the one that goes. In 1907, that became a popular song. Of course, in 1907, those were the days before political correctness. So this was a song about an Indian maiden by the name of Red Wing, which was very popular 110 years ago, and it went like this. There once was an Indian maid 
a shy little prairie maid who sang night and day a love song so gay as on the plain she galloped far away. She loved a warrior bold, this shy little maid of old, but so brave and gay she rode one day to battle far away. Oh, the moon shines tonight on pretty red wing, the breeze is sighing, the night bird's crying. Oh, far neath the stars, her grave is sleeping, while Red Wing's weeping her heart away. Well, I will remind this audience that before the Industrial Revolution, we didn't have unions. And before we had unions, didn't have, when we didn't have unions, we didn't have a middle class. The middle class and the unions happened at the same time. And now as our unions are disappearing, pay attention, you'll see your middle class start to disappear. Well, in the time when Woody Guthrie was working in the late 1930s and early 40s, a lot of the work that he could get was singing for people who were having union meetings. And they'd pay him and his pal Pete Seeger a dollar or two to come down and sing some of their original union songs. And so singing for a union meeting, Woody Guthrie took the song Red Wing about that Indian maid and thought maybe it would be more interesting if she was a union maid. So this is what Woody Guthrie did with that same tune. There once was a union maid who never was afraid of the goons and the ginks and the company finks and the deputy sheriffs who made the raids. She went to the union hall when a meeting it was called. And when those company boys came round, she always stood her ground. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Till the day I die, let's sing it together. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union till the day I die. Now you experience how those words just fall off your tongue. You can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. It's the perfect marriage of melody and words. And that was Woody Guthrie's gift to take these old songs that a lot of people knew, he recycled the melody, he made up words that fit them so perfectly, people sting, still sing his words today. And if you ever go down to a picket line, if you need a song to sing, that is the one everybody will jump in on that chorus. It's just so perfect the way it falls off your tongue. You can't stare me, I'm sticking to the union. I'll tell you a story that I learned from my mentor, Sam Hinton. Sam was born in Tulsa in 1917, and he distinguished himself as a great folk singer, and he's the guy who used to come to the libraries when I was a little kid, and you can see he made a big impression on me because look what I'm doing for a living 45 years later. <laughs> Sam passed away in the summer of 2009 at the age of 92, and his great interest when he was young was to study to be a biologist. And when you were a kid in East Texas during the Depression, what they would do in the summer as a research project is they would send those kids out to the Southern California desert to measure the temperature in horn toads. You can just picture these kids in the 110 degree weather trying to catch one of these little reptiles and, you know, put a little thermometer in their mouth and see what the temperature was. So here's the story that, uh, story that he told me. You have to remember that this happened at a time in history when the Great Dust Bowl was going on. Now, you probably know that uh, farmers who came out to the Great Plains states in the 1870s and 1880s, they hit upon a kind of um, Russian wheat that they wanted to grow, and this was before the knowledge of crop rotation. So they grew this Russian wheat in the same place year after year after year, and the, till the soil turned to black talcum that rose up in the air, the worst uh, dust storm was on April 15th, April 14th of 1935. Woody was living about uh, 50 miles uh, north of Amarillo up on the Panhandle in Texas, and he says that when that storm came up at midday with all the curtains open, you could sit in the house at noon with your hand in front of your face and not be able to see it at all. If you go in the library and look at the pictures, like snow, you'll see these black drifts going up as high as the roof with cattle standing on top of the roof of the barn. Well, these poor Okies and Arkies who were affected by the Dust Bowl, some of them just couldn't even get back into their buildings. They walked 1,500 miles with their shoes in their hands and blisters on their feet 
going out to California to the Peach Bowl, hoping that they'd get a better shake, and many of them did not. It was a great disaster, and it's well worth reading about. It's well documented in the library. That dust cloud went, was so big that people in Manhattan could see it. Drove a lot of people out of Arkansas and Oklahoma. They all went west thinking that they'd go out to the Peach Bowl and be able to save their fortunes, which in fact was not the case. Sam was out there in 1937 measuring the temperature in horn toads. And in that same part of California, there were all sorts of refugee camps for these displaced Okies and Arkies. Three or 400 families all on a hillside trying to use one tiny little spring, no bigger than the water that comes out of your bathtub, as a kitchen sink and a sewer and a place to shave and brush their teeth. And it was a pretty rough time. And Sam went through those camps collecting folk songs. And what surprised him is he heard many different versions of a talking blues song that they called the Talking Dust Bowl Blues. And later Sam discovered it was a song that Woody Guthrie had written before he left Oklahoma. But all these people had brought it with them to California and it was already in the oral tradition only a dozen or two months after Woody had written it, which is pretty remarkable for folk songs because it usually takes a whole lot longer before they pass into the oral tradition. The first thing that happens when you enter the oral tradition is Nobody remembers who wrote the song. And none of these people who sang the song for Sam in 1937 had any idea who Woody Guthrie was or that he had written it. But his song was already widespread throughout these camps, and I'll share it with you now. This is the one that is called the Talking Dust Bowl Blues. It's based on a venerable old tradition called the Talking Blues, which was first recorded in 1924, where you play a pattern on the guitar, and rather than sing, you kind of talk your way through the song like this. Along about 1927, I had a little farm that I called heaven. And the price is up and the rain came down, so I hauled my crops into town and I got the money. Bought clothes and groceries, fed the kids, raised a family. But the rain quit and the wind got high and a black old dust storm filled the sky and I swapped my farm for a Ford machine and I Filled it full of that gas I lean and I started a rockin' and a rollin' Out of the old dust bowl, heading west to the good old peach bowl. Way up yonder on a mountain road, I had a hot motor and a heavy load. I was going pretty fast and I wasn't even stopping, bouncing up and down like popcorn popping. I had me a kind of a breakdown. It was a, sort of a nervous bust down, it was. There was a feller there, a mechanic feller, he said what I had was called engine trouble. Well, way up yonder on a mountain road, it was way up yonder in the piney woods, I'd give that rolling Ford a shove and I started to coast as fast as I could. Well, I commenced to coasting. Picking up speed. There was a hairpin turn. I didn't make it. Well, man alive, I'm telling you, the fiddles and the guitars really flew, and that Ford took off like a flying squirrel. Flew halfway around the world, scattering wives and children all over the side of that there mountain. Well, we got out to the West Coast broke, so damn hungry, I thought I'd choke, and I bummed up a sput or two, and my wife fixed up a tater stew, and we just poured the kids full of it. Mighty thin stew, though. Could have read a magazine right through it. You know, I always did figure if that stew was just a little bit thinner, some of these here politicians could have seen through it too. If you go into the library and you look in the folk music section, you'll see books of folk songs that have the name Lomax on the spine. John Avery Lomax was born in the 1870s in Texas. He's the first man to collect a book of folk songs published in 1910. Cowboy Songs and Other Frontier Ballads, which still a century later is one of the best books on the subject. And his son, Alan Lomax, kind of grew up in the Library of Congress, traveling around with his dad, recording all those songs at the prisons and the farms, and then putting him into the Library of Congress. So in 1940 in March, Alan Lomax invited Woody Guthrie to come to the Library of Congress and tell some of his stories. 
And when I was a kid, they were very rare and hard to find, but now it's all on YouTube and on CDs in the library, so if you're interested, it's a lot more accessible now than it used to be. One of the stories that Woody told to Alan Lomax in that March 1940 interview <coughs> went something like this. Woody didn't drive a lot, he liked to hitchhike, so he was riding as a passenger in a pickup truck with a farmer, and they stopped to pick up an old preacher. And the preacher said, I'm affected by the Dust Bowl, so I'm gonna go out west to California. I saw a handbill that said they'll pay me $5 a day to pick fruit. And Woody, who'd been out to California several times and was pretty well-traveled, and was actually fairly well educated, especially on books about philosophy and Eastern religion. He likes to, use, to like to pretend that he was kind of a country boy and put people on, but he was somebody who spent a lot of time in the library and was pretty book learned as it was. So he politely said to this preacher, he said, you know, I've been out to California a few times and if you go to California and you see a $5 bill, you're gonna be standing in the bank looking through the bars at the teller who's <laughs> holding it up between their hands. Woody said, when you get out there, they're going to offer you a dollar a day, excuse me, a dollar a ton to pack peaches, and you can take it or leave it. That they circulate these handbills telling the people who are all out of work and in trouble that they're going to get five bucks a day. Well, that was just a false incentive to get them to go out there. And Woody always used to say, you know, if you go to California, you're going to need plenty of do, re, mi, and he wasn't talking about the musical notes, the scale. You have to remember that the people in California were very privileged, and they produced all this food. And their Filipino workers, and Japanese workers, and Mexican workers, and Chinese farm workers, by that time, they had all managed to organize and unionize so that they wouldn't be wage slaves. So the people in California welcomed these Okies and Arkies in so they could pay them a lot less money, but they didn't treat them very well. In fact, they called them Dust Bowl refugees with great disdain. So this was the song that Woody Guthrie wrote about California, and it's the one called Do Ring Me. Thousands of folks back east, they say, are leaving home most every day, heading the hot old dusty way to the California line. Across the desert sands they roll, getting out of that old dust bowl. They think they're going to a sugar bowl. Here's what they find, for the police at the port of entry say, you're number 14,000 for today. And if you ain't got the do re -mi, boys, if you ain't got the do re -mi, well, you better go back to beautiful Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Georgia, Tennessee. California, it's a garden of Eden, a paradise to live in or see. But believe it or not, you won't find it so hot if you ain't got that do re -mi. If you want to buy you a home or farm that can't do nobody harm or take your vacation by the mountains or the sea don't swap your old horse for a car you better stay right where you are you better take this little tip from me cause i look through the won't ads every day and the headlines in the papers always say if you ain't got the do re me boys if you ain't got the do re me well, you better go back to beautiful Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Georgia, Tennessee. California, it's a garden of Eden, a paradise to live in or see. But believe it or not, you won't find it so hot if you ain't got the do re -mi. Yes, believe it or not, you won't find it so hot if you ain't got the do re -mi. It's surprising how many scholars have addressed the subject of Woody Guthrie. You might be inclined to go into the library and read a book about his life after you listen to this program. You'll probably go and grab a copy of Bound for Glory, his autobiography, which is usually filed in the library in the biography section. And you'll be so eager to read it that you won't even notice that on the frontispiece, Woody himself wrote the words, autobiographical fiction. Because <laughs> he made the whole thing up. 
and it really ought to be over in the fiction section, but they the thing hasn't gone out of print yet, and all the libraries have it, and it's a darn good read. It's a page turner. Woody Guthrie knew he didn't have a lot of time, and he wanted to be famous, and one of the ways to do it if you're on that path is to write a fictional autobiography that is a page turner. I would like to recommend two nonfiction books in the adult section about Woody's life if you're genuinely interested. My favorite is a book by an author called Ed Cray, C-R-A-Y, and it's called Ramblin' Man. And there's another excellent book in the library by a fellow named Jimmy Longhi, L-O-N-G-H-I, called Woody, Cisco, and Me. Now, it's funny, most of these scholars who've worked on the subject of Woody Guthrie, they weren't gifted with an audiographic ear that so many musicians have, so they always puzzle about where Woody Guthrie got his uh, melodies from. Well, I'm kind of a simple fellow, so I took an Excel spreadsheet and I listed all the Carter family tunes in one column and then started listening to the Woody Guthrie recordings in another and uh, started putting them in another column and make a long story very short, it seems that Woody recycled about 47 uh, melodies of the Carter family and his famous favorite dozen of those he recycled over and over, there, as well as a number of child ballads that are still sung today. Uh, his brain was sort of a psychic landfill and he very organically recycled these melodies. He wrote one song about rambling around your city, rambling around your town, I never see a friendly face as I go rambling around. And his buddy, his traveling companion, Pete Seeger said, do you know that you used the melody of Goodnight Irene for that song? And nobody was more surprised than Woody because it came out of him so organically. And that's how it is for certain songwriters who are so gifted with the recycling of melodies in their head. So there's one tune from the Carter family, and I want to point out that the Carter family what they mostly did was collect older songs and publish them at a time in history when the publishing laws were brand new and it was a free-for-all. But this tune was actually published in a piece of sheet music that you can find on the internet today, written by a woman named Maud Irving way back in 1869 before any of those Carters were born. And uh, if you're familiar with it, you know how the bluegrass players, they always go up to you, they say, play Fox on the Run or Rocky Top? Well, if you're an auto harp player, everybody wants you to play the Wildwood Flower. So in a minute, I'll show you what Woody did with that tune. Woody's best buddy from California was a folk singer by the name of Cisco Houston. And if you have never listened to Cisco Houston, go into the library, go on the internet and find his recordings. He's one of my great inspirations and one of my favorites. And he was a very loyal traveling companion of Woody's. They did a lot of recordings together for Mo Ash over at Folkways Records. And their third buddy was a man who later became a lawyer in New York City, a fellow by the name of Jimmy Longy. Well, these men liked to hang out together and play music and this was during the Second World War. And one of the ways to get to avoid getting drafted in World War II was to volunteer and join the Merchant Marines. Civilians who went over on those liberty ships with the soldiers and acted as waiters and dishwashers and cooks, providing the meals for those men who were gonna participate in the conflict overseas. So in 1943, in May, these three men, as uh, mer merchant marines, went out on the William B. Travis out of the uh, Buttermilk Channel in New Jersey and sailed out into the Atlantic. And the following year, in May of 1944, they signed up again, and this time they went out on the SS Sea Porpoise, out to the submarine killing grounds, out across the Atlantic on their way to Europe. Well. At this point, some of the destroyers accompanying the convoy detected submarines, so they began dropping the depth charges. And with the soldiers, the 3,000 soldiers who were confined in five holes at the bottom of the ship there, the sound of those explosions was quite terrifying. It was a lot louder if you were there down at the bottom of the ship. And the, uh, the commander of the ship confined all of the soldiers to their quarters, and they were terrified stacked five high in their bunks, confined below deck. And Woody and the other merchant marines were way up near the uh, top of the ship in their tiny, confined little cabins. And Woody heard those depth charges going up, so he put his harmonica in his pocket and tuned his guitar and 
picked up his mandolin and said to Cisco and Jimmy, well, this is probably pretty scary for those soldiers. I'm gonna go down below and play some music for them. And Jimmy Longy said, are you crazy? If we get hit, you'll never survive if you're down there. It's much safer to be up here. And Woody said, well, suit yourself. I'm gonna go play some music for them. They're probably frightened. Well, Cisco looked at Jimmy and Jimmy looked at Cisco and they felt so guilty. They got their guitars and their mandolins and they, they followed Woody down there. Now, Jimmy Longy remembered many decades later, he said that, you know, when those blasts are going off, there are 3,000 men confined below on a ship that only has six lifeboats. You wanna to climb to the top of a mast or go up on deck and put one of your hands right on the edge of that lifeboat. It's a pretty scary thing. And to volunteer to go down below and sing for the soldiers is insanity. And he said that he thought that Woody was very saint-like. He said, that's what the saint does. He, he puts his brothers before himself. So they all went down there to play in the number three hole. 600 men, all frightened, most of them very young. And Woody had written a song back on November 1st, 1941, when he picked up the newspaper and read that on Halloween night, the SS Reuben James had been sunk off the coast of Iceland and most of the people on that ship didn't survive. So as he always did, he took a Carter family tune, this time the Wildwood Flower, and he made a song about the sinking of the Reuben James. And he and Jimmy and Cisco went down into that hold and faced those frightened soldiers with those blasts going off on the depth charges. And this is what Woody sang. <laughs> Have you heard of a ship called the Good Ribbon James? And those hard fighting men, both of honor and of fame. She flew the stars and stripes of the land of the free, but tonight she's in her grave at the bottom of the sea. Tell me what were their names, tell me what were their names, did you have a friend on the good Reuben James. What were their names? Tell me what were their names? Did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? Well, the soldiers calmed down and they picked up that chorus and they started singing along. And Woody and Cisco and Jimmy sang with them for 90 minutes till the depth charges faded out and the noises stopped. So let's sing it together. It's a great chorus. It goes like this. What were their names? Tell me, what were their names? Did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? What were their names? Tell me, what were their names? Did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? Well, 100 men went down to their dark, watery grave when that good ship went down, only 44 were saved. It was the last day of October when they saved 44 from the cold icy waters by the cold Iceland shore. Tell me what were their names, tell me what were their names, did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? What were their names, tell me what were their names, did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? It was there in the dark of that uncertain night that they watched for the U-boats and waited for the fight. Then the wine and the rock and the great explosion roared and they laid the Reuben James on the cold ocean floor. Tell me what were their names, tell me what were their names, did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? What were their names? Tell me what were their names? Did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? Now many years have passed since those brave men are gone and those cold icy waters now are still and are calm. Many years have passed, but still I wonder why the worst of men must fight, and the best of men must die. Tell me what were their names, tell me what were their names, did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? What were their names, tell me what were their names, did you have a friend on the good Reuben James?
festooned with instruments, Woody and Jimmy and Cisco made their way out of the number three hold, and as they were going back to their cabin, they heard what sounded like black soldiers singing in one of the bathrooms. Great acoustics and great echoing. So they followed the sound and Woody popped his head in and he said, that's some of the best singing I've ever heard. Why don't you come back with us to the number three hold and we'll sing for the soldiers. And the, the black sergeant who seemed to be in charge, he said, well, we can't do that. Woody said, well, why not? Why not? What's the problem? Why can't we come and sing with you? And the soldier said, well, this is a colored toilet. You have to understand that uh, a nation segregated in peacetime was also segregated in wartime. Well, Woody said, I don't care. It sounds really good to me. So he came in there and he kicked off John Henry and they were all playing, singing together with these 50 black soldiers all singing so beautifully with the great acoustics in this bathroom. And a white sergeant was coming up the hall and he knew that was a colored toilet. And he peeked his head inside and he saw what was going on. He said, you can't do that. You have to come out of there go back to the number three hold and sing for their soldiers again. We're getting more of those depth charges. And Woody said, well, I'm only gonna do it if these black soldiers can come and be my choir. The sergeant said, no way, this is a segregated army. And he went to report them to the captain. And the captain reported it to the colonel. And the colonel realized that Woody and Jimmy and Cisco were not army men. They were merchant marines, civilians, and not subject to army orders. So as the depth charges got louder and the soldiers became more panicked, the colonel had to relent. And he sent the sergeant back to tell him it was okay. And with those 50 black soldiers in tow, Woody and Cisco and Jimmy returned to the number three hold to make more music for those frightened soldiers. Woody Guthrie with his guitar that had the words written in pen all around the sound hole of his instrument, this machine kills fascists. Tell me what were their names? Tell me what were their names? Did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? What were their names? Tell me what were their names? Did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? Well, Woody recycled melodies for all of these songs. He wrote a thousand American songs in a period of his life that only spanned 12 or 13 years. He didn't have a lot of time and he was very productive. I'll tell you a story about a song that Woody wrote that's the only one for which he didn't compose the melody. Originally, this song was just a chant that he recited without music. And then about 10 years after Woody had written it, a school teacher by the name of Martin Hoffman took a beautiful tune that he made and really completed the song. And the story of this song, remember Woody was the kind of guy who could open up the newspaper and read a story and it would inspire a song that he would make up on the spot. Well, it was in uh, January of 1948 that uh, a plane load of Spanish speaking farm workers were being returned from California to Mexico. Although Woody didn't know this because the newspaper article didn't tell him, they had a program during World War II when all those farmhands, the sons and the cousins and uh, the brothers of those farmers in America were off serving in the military. There was nobody to pick the crops. So they had this Bracero program that they worked out with Mexico where the farm workers could come into the United States and then at the end of the harvest season, if they were stuck here without any money, the U.S. Uh, government agreed to buy them a plane ticket and fly them back to Mexico. So this plane in January of 1948 was full of um, Mexican farm workers who were being flown back to Mexico. Now this is a peculiar story. There's a lot of details of this thing that don't make sense. Um, the first thing is, is that the pilot who was flying this plane took off in the wrong plane. He had a crew of four and 28 passengers but he took off in the wrong aircraft that only had 28 seats. So four of these farm workers were sitting on piles of baggage in the back of the plane. That was the first red flag. The pilot's wife was the stewardess. There was a co-pilot and one other crew member who was serving. And uh, this happened in a place called Coalinga, California, out by about 20 miles east of the Los Gatos Canyon. 
I performed out there at the Koalinga Library in January, and I sang this song. There was an elderly woman sitting in the front row who identified herself as Dolores Crabtree, who lives out there about uh, 400 feet from where this plane crashed, and she was an eyewitness to the event. And she told me the following. She said, as you looked up in the sky, remember this was a, I'm trying to remember, what, what do they call the C-47? I'm not an expert on airplanes. Was it the DC-8? DC-3? Anyway, DC-7, thank you. Um, one of the two propellers was on fire on the wing, and the plane went into a tailspin, and right next to where Dolores lived was a camp of some 300 prisoners, and these men were certain that this plane was going to come down and crash right on top of them. But fortunately, the plane crashed just a few hundred yards away from there, and nobody was killed except all 32 people on that aircraft. And she said that you could see people's bodies still sitting in the chairs as they came crashing to the ground. And she said if you went out there today, you'd still find little tiny pieces of metal and wood from that airplane crash way back in January of 1948. Well, what Woody Guthrie thought was interesting was the newspaper article gave you the name of the pilot and his wife and the co-pilot and the other crew member who were English-speaking. But of the 28 Spanish-speaking passengers, their names were not listed. And Woody thought that was the interesting part of the story. Well, the song was written way back in 1948, but it wouldn't be that different if you wrote it in 2016. So since it's that song that Woody wrote that Martin Hoffman made the melody to, and it's called Deportee. <laughs> Crops are all in and the peaches are rotting. The oranges are stacked in their creosote dumps. They're flying them back to that Mexican border to pay all their wages to wade back again. Goodbye to my Juan, goodbye Rosalita. Adios mi amigos, Jesus and Maria. You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane And all they will call you will be deportees My father's own father, he waited that river They took all the money he made in his life My brothers and sisters come work in the fruit trees And they rode on those trucks till they took down and died Goodbye to my Juan, goodbye Rosalita. Adios, mi amigos, Jesus and Maria. You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane. And all they will call you will be deportees. Now some are illegal and some are not wanted. Our work contract's up and we've got to move on. 600 miles to that Mexican border. They chase us like outlaws, like rustlers, like thieves. Goodbye to my Juan, goodbye Rosalita. Adios, mi amigos, Jesus and Maria. You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane. And all they will call you will be We died in your hills, and we died in your deserts. We died in your valleys, we died in your plains. We died in your fields, and we died in your orchards. Both sides of the river, we died just the same. Goodbye, my Juan, goodbye, Rosalita. Adios, mi amigos, Jesus and Maria. You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane. All they will call you will be deportees. The sky plane caught fire over Los Gatos Canyon like a fireball of lightning and shook all our hills. Who are all these friends all scattered like dry leaves? The radio says they are just deportees. Goodbye to my Juan, goodbye Rosalita. 
Adios, mi amigos, Jesus and Maria. You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane. And all they will call you will be deportees. Is this the best way we can grow our good orchards? Is this the best way we can grow our good fruit? To fall like dry leaves and rot on your topsoil And be known by no name except deportees Goodbye to my Juan, goodbye Rosalita Adios mi amigos, Jesus and Maria You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane All they will call you will be deportees In my time, I've played about 2,000 libraries in 48 states, and I can tell you, you can play anywhere once. And I'm so delighted to be invited back to Marshalltown and get to sing for you tonight. Thank you to the librarians for inviting me here. Thank you to all of you for coming out and singing along. I want to mention that on the table with the black tablecloth at the back of the room, I have a white mailing list. And if you give me your email address, and it is legible, I will let you know the next time I pass through this part of the world and where I will be performing. I have uh, performed for a million and a half children in the United States. I do about 200 school assemblies every year. And I have brochures and business cards about the work I do in the schools. If you will pick up my brochure and place it firmly in the hand of a school principal or somebody on the PTA, next time I pass through, they will invite me back to talk to the kids about the old songs and the oral tradition. Um, I also have some CDs with me, six different CDs. Uh, when you buy my CD, not only do you get an hour of listening pleasure over and over again with the people you care for most, but far more importantly, you get to take home a little piece of me and I get to take home a little piece of you. <laughs> and before we go, I wanna talk about uh, the fact that if you're watching somebody sing these old songs in the 21st century, pay attention to the fact that you're not in a coffee house or a club or a theater. You're in the meeting room of your own local public library and you better get used to it. This is where the cultural arts programs are going to be presented in this century. Check out all the different cultural arts programs your librarians will be presenting to you. Most of them are free and many of them are funded by one of the most subversive and radical groups in the 21st century. I am of course speaking about the dreaded Friends of the Library. <laughs> When the municipality or the city or the county or the librarians say, you know, we just can't afford that, the friends of the library say, oh, yes, we can. Join your local friends of the library. It's a very nominal fee. Become a member. If you have free time, volunteer for your friends of the library, peruse their book sales, and when you buy those books for a dollar a piece, stop and think about how many of those books they would have to sell to fund a single musical program of this kind. If you only learn one thing from this little sermon, learn this. Libraries will get you through times of no money a whole lot better than money is going to get you through times of no libraries. <laughs> If you will indulge me, I'll tell you one more story before we go. Remember that Woody was born on July 14th of 1912, 12 days after Woodrow Wilson, his namesake, was nominated for the presidency. Well, Woodrow Wilson was kind of whitewashed in the days when I was a school kid, but if you read a 21st century biography, you'll remember that he was a southerner and he was a racist. He's the man who segregated the federal government. His favorite movie was D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, subtitled The Klansman. And in his time as president, the Klan actually had a great revival. Wilson ran for president in a second term in 1916 on a campaign that said, vote for me, you vote for peace, vote for the other guy, you vote for war. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. <coughs> Within 18 months of making that statement, he got the United States into World War I, which I want to remind you was a conflict between England and France and Germany. But the American bankers had invested so heavily in all sides of the wars, they usually do because they don't care who wins, they just want to make a buck, 
But the bankers went to Woodrow Wilson in 1917 and they said, you know what? If Germany wins this war, we're never gonna get our money back. So guess what? The United States sent troops to participate in the First World War. And about 100,000 of those American troops came home, missing arms and legs and eyes with mental illness and depression. And as family members, they were a painful reminder to Americans between the First World War and the Second World War that foreign wars were no good. And it created a group of people in the United States who called themselves isolationists. An isolationist is somebody who believes that American troops should not participate in the war until the troops are landing on the shores of North America. It's a far cry from the way we do things in the 21st century, but I want to remind you that between World War I and World War II, six out of 10 voters in the United States identified themselves as isolationists, and Woody Guthrie was among them. Woody Guthrie had a job in 1939 at a little station in Los Angeles, a radio station called KFVD, and they paid him a dollar a day to sing his Dust Bowl ballads and talk his anti-war socialist talk against this war that was brewing over the seas in Europe. And then over Labor Day weekend, Hitler's army invaded Poland, and for the second time in the century, England declared war on Germany, and World War II was a done deal. And when that station manager got back from his lovely three-day holiday vacation, the first thing he did on Tuesday morning was he fired Woody Guthrie. Because in the United States, you can say whatever you want about a war before it's declared, but once that war is going on, you better be careful what side of the fence you're on. And Woody Guthrie was on the wrong side of the fence. So here he was in Los Angeles, as winter was starting to come on without a jacket, a suitcase, or a guitar, but in his back pocket, he had a letter from his friend, Will Gear, same man who lived up in Topanga Canyon when Frank Hamilton wanted that harmonica lesson. Does anybody remember Will Gear? Will Gear, when I was a kid, played the part of Grandpa Waltons on a very popular television show called The Waltons. But I want to remind you, that was one of the first paying jobs he could get in theater or film or television, because he was blacklisted. Blacklisted didn't then during that communist scare. Fear that he might be a fellow traveler, one of those dreaded communists like Woody Guthrie. I remind you that Woody Guthrie was never a member of the Communist Party because he was so disorganized, nobody would have let him join. <laughs> but when this story took place, things were different for Will Gear. When I was a little boy, you could hire him in Los Angeles to be a landscaper and put shrubs in your lawn. But when this story took place, Will Gear was the highest paid actor in New York City, playing the part of Jeter Lester in a brand new play on Broadway called Tobacco Road. So he wrote in his letter to his pal Woody Guthrie, he said, Woody, if you can't get any singing work in LA, hitchhike across the country and we'll get you some work in New York. And if nobody will play you to sing, I'll get you a job on the stage crew because I'm the star of the show. So without a jacket, a suitcase, or a guitar, Woody Guthrie put that letter in his pocket and stuck out his thumb on Route 66 and began making that 3,000 mile journey across the country as autumn was passing into winter. And every time he stopped for a cigarette, or a cup of coffee or a sandwich. He heard a song on all the jukeboxes and radio stations that had been written by a man who was born in Russia and emigrated to this country with his rabbi father and his impoverished Jewish family and lived on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in great poverty till he was able to get a job as a singing waiter in 1907. Then in 1911, he published a piece of sheet music that sold a million copies and suddenly he was well off. And in 1918, he volunteered as a private in the United States Army. And writing a show for soldiers to perform, he made up a song about the United States. But he thought it was inappropriate at that time, in 1918. It was such a flag-waving patriotic song. This was during the war about we're gonna get the Hun and over there. So he, he just stuck that song in his grape juice file. Now, do we have songwriters here tonight? You know about that grape juice file? When you write a new song, it goes in the grape juice file. And in 20 or 30 years, you can check back and see if it turned to crappy vinegar or good wine. <laughs> Only time will tell. So 20 years later, in 1938, a singer by the name of Kate Smith said to the songwriter, she said, Mr. Irving Berlin, do you have any songs in your trunk that are patriotic? Because I'd like to record one. So she recorded this song, and 
It was such a big hit that when Woody was traveling a year later, he couldn't go anywhere where they weren't playing this song on the radio with the jukebox. You know the one I mean? One like this went. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. Well, it's a great song, and a lot of kids on school campuses still sing it in our century. But I want to remind you that in 1939, Woody Guthrie hated this song. He hated this song because he was broken hitchhiking, and Irving Berlin was a multi-millionaire driven around in a chauffeured limousine, eating in restaurants, having servants in his home, and he owned the Music Box Theater on Broadway. And when he wrote songs for those Hollywood movies, he actually got to retain his copyrights to some of the songs which very few songwriters could command at any time in American history. Woody had another reason to hate this song, though. He traveled back and forth between Oklahoma and California, between New York and the West Coast many times during this Great Depression, when one out of four people couldn't get a job. And Woody saw these mothers and fathers waiting on long lines of thousands of people for a free loaf of bread or a bowl of soup. And he wanted to know how a multimillionaire could be so insensitive as to write a song called God Bless America when nobody could get a job. Now you might think Woody was sacrilegious, but he came from a church-going family in Okima, Oklahoma. And he wasn't being sacrilegious at all. He was just being logical. All these families were wishing they were a little bit more blessed. Why are they singing God Bless America? So he said, when I get to New York City, I'm gonna write another song that says all the things about America that God Bless America doesn't say. Then in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to get out of a snowstorm, Woody went into a diner and on the radio there he heard somebody say that God Bless America was going to replace the Star Spangled Banner as the national anthem. Well, this might sound like a crazy suggestion to you, but I want to remind you that that song didn't become our national anthem till 1931. And this was only eight years later and it's a three octave song that practically nobody can sing and would have been reasonable to replace it. So Woody said that does it. When I get to New York, I'm writing another song. Well, Woody tried to hitchhike out of Pittsburgh in a bad snowstorm, and the next morning, a local policeman found Woody shivering and freezing to death. So he, he picked Woody up and put him in the back of the patrol car and drove him to the home of his own parents, and that cop's parents filled Woody with hot soup and coffee, and out of compassion, they bought Woody a ticket to Grand Central Station in New York. So Woody rode in style through that storm to Grand Central Station in New York City without a jacket, suitcase, or guitar, and he took Will Gear's letter out of his pocket and began asking directions to their home. And he stayed with the Gears for 10 days because Will Gear thought Woody Guthrie could do no wrong. And on his way out of the house, Woody borrowed a pre-World War II Brazilian Rosewood Martin guitar. Be worth about $10,000 if we had it here tonight in the meeting room of the library. But not after Woody took it out in that storm. That thing filled up with water. He walked to the corner of 43rd Street and 6th Avenue, just one long block from the New York Public Library, and there in a little hotel that doesn't exist anymore called Hanover House, Woody Guthrie checked himself into a room with a small desk, and there at that desk with a yellow pencil like the children use in the classrooms and a piece of that lined notebook paper, Woody Guthrie wrote his song about the United States of America. He appropriated the tune from an old Carter family hymn that they recorded in Bristol, Tennessee in 1928. He dedicated the first verse of that song to Irving Berlin, the man who written God Bless America, and he put it in his own grape juice file because if you're going to write a thousand songs in less than 15 years, you've got to knock a couple off every day. And he didn't think about it much. Well, 12 years after this story, Woody was married to that Martha Graham dancer, Marjorie Mazia, and they were living in New York City. And it seemed like every time Woody had even a half a glass of wine, he got unnecessarily belligerent. And it became such a problem that one night his wife Marjorie had to call the police. She didn't want him arrested, but she did try to emphasize to him that maybe his drinking was becoming a problem. So in the summer of 1952, Woody went down to the drunk tank and subsequently checked him stale into the Brooklyn State Hospital. And the first thing they found out was alcohol was not Woody's problem. They didn't know what the problem was. And he was there for months. And about three months later, there was a new young doctor there who looked at Woody's chart. 
and turned to Woody's doctor and said, how come this patient has never been checked for Huntington's disease? Well, they gave Woody the blood test and he finally figured out what had put his mother Nora in that asylum in Norton, Oklahoma. Well, Woody was there at the Brooklyn State Hospital as a voluntary patient in and out for two years and he got sicker and sicker and finally, in 1954, he went into the hospital for one of the very last times. And he stayed there as a patient from September of 1954 till May of 1956. And because he was a voluntary patient, at the end of May of 1956, an unshaven and scruffy Woody Guthrie checked himself out of Brooklyn State Hospital and made his way across Manhattan to the home of Harold Leventhal, the man who was the producer and manager of the band called The Weavers. Now Harold and his wife were out to dinner, so Woody slumped in front of their door and they found him there when they got home. They invited Woody Guthrie in, and Woody attempted to light a cigarette, but his hands were shaking so badly, he dropped the lit cigarette and burned a hole in their couch. He told Harold that he was broke, and Harold gave Woody Guthrie a $20 bill and sent him out into the night. On May 28, 1956, the Morristown, New Jersey police arrested Woody Guthrie for trespassing the local definition of wandering aimlessly on a highway with a dazed look on your face. They took Woody down and he spent the night in the Morris County Jail. The following morning he was examined by a Dr. Camo who determined that Woody was dangerous to himself and others. And Judge Norman K. Minsk committed Woody Guthrie to the New Jersey State Hospital at Greystone Park. Well, Woody had told the cops that he was a sick man that he needed to go to hospital, not a jail. When he got to Greystone, he told the doctors, what I have is called Huntington's disease. It's what my mother had. This is just how she walked. This is just what happened to her. They didn't believe Woody. They classified him as paranoid schizophrenic, and it was six months before they took him at his word that he had Huntington's disease. When Harold Leventhal came to visit to see how Woody was doing, the doctor took him aside and looked at Woody's file and he chuckled and he said to Harold, this patient is truly crazy. He's mentally ill. He says he wrote over a thousand songs. That's how crazy he is. Well, old Woody Guthrie. He spent four years, 10 months, and five days at Greystone. He was patient number 65935 in Ward 40, which Woody called Wardy 40. And then finally, in April of 1961, they discharged a very disabled Woody Guthrie. And some crazy doctor had written on his chart that he was improved, but that was not the case. Within a year, Woody Guthrie was confined to a wheelchair, and Woody spent the last five years of his life laying in a hospital bed, losing control of the muscles in his body. His wife, Marjorie, who even though she divorced Woody and remarried, she made it clear to her husband that she would be spending her life raising awareness for Huntington's disease, raising money for Huntington's disease, and taking care of Woody in the hospital. She used to say to Woody, would you like a sip of water through a straw? And Woody would blink his eyes twice for yes and once for no, because they were the last muscles he could move in his body. And as he lay there in that hospital bed, slowly turned into stone, that little song he'd written back in New York City at Hanover House, well, somehow it went around the world. And without ever being on the radio or the television, it has become one of the best known English language folk songs in the whole wide world. That means whatever country your ancestors came from, whatever language they may have spoken at home, if they knew one song in English that wasn't Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star, Old MacDonald or Happy Birthday to You, they probably knew the one that Woody Guthrie wrote at Hanover House in February of 1940, at the corner of 43rd Street and 6th Avenue, just one long block from the New York Public Library. And since every single person in this room has been singing this song for decades, perhaps I could persuade you to sing it with me before we go out and enjoy this absolutely gorgeous evening. You know the one I mean? This land is your land. This land is my land, from California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. As I was walking 
that ribbon of a highway I saw above me, that endless skyway I saw below me, that golden valley. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. So I go to about 200 schools every year, and I've never met an early childhood educator in any state who doesn't make it their personal responsibility to make sure the students learn the words to this song, but when Woody wrote this song at Hanover House in 1940, it was not a children's folk song. And most of the verses he wrote there, the kindergarten teachers won't touch with an 11-foot pole, but I thought it might be educational to share them with you. The first verse that he wrote was dedicated to Irving Berlin, the man who'd written the song, God Bless America. In fact, Woody was gonna call his song, God Bless America for me, until he found the words, this land is your land, were so inclusive and fell right off your tongue. But here's the verse he wrote for Irving Berlin. In the shadow of the steeple, I saw my people. By the welfare office, I saw my people. As they stood there hungry, I stood there whispering. Did God bless America for me? He wrote another verse at Hanover House that went like this. There was a great big wall there that tried to stop me. And a great big sign there said private property. But on the other side, you know, it didn't say nothing. Well, that side was made for you and me. You ever think about where Woody got this tune? Go into the library. You'll probably find those CDs that have the original recordings of the Carter family from Hilton's Virginia. And in a session in Bristol, Tennessee in 1928, they recorded an old hymn, which is where Woody got his tune. And the old hymn went like this. Oh, my darling brother, when the world's on fire, do you want God's bosom? Be your pillow, won't you tide me over in the rock of ages? Oh, rock of ages, cleft for me. We don't sing those words anymore, do we? We sing Woody's words. This land is your land, this land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forests to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. He wrote one more verse at Hanover House that I think is so important. I always sing it for the kids, no matter how old they are. Nobody living can ever stop me as I go walking down Freedom's Highway. Nobody living can make me turn back cause this land was made you and me. Let's sing it together. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands. From the Redwood Forests to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. Let's do it one more time. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. This land was made for you and me. This land was made for you and me.
This land was made for you and me. Thank you so much.